Joy, very good. Um, explain to us uh, what, first of all, I should introduce you a little bit more. Uh, Joy is a Floridian. Uh, she got her master's degree at Florida State, and she came here today from Chicago. And I'm astonished how long you all have been working on this film. It's been about a decade of work, um, of hunting down footage and hunting down stories and fact-checking stories. And then after assembling everything, figuring out how to turn that into a story. Um, because we set for ourselves a task that made our job a lot harder because we only wanted to use her voice. We didn't want to use the sorts of shorthand that a lot of documentaries use where they bring in a historian or they have a voice of God kind of narrator or they put a lot of text on screen. Um, we kind of wanted all of the information you get about Fannie Lou Hamer and her world to come from Fannie Lou Hamer and her world rather than us kind of spoon feeding it to you. But that's why it took 10 years of, of finding the those gems of archival media and spending years just driving around Mississippi getting footage of places where she was. Um, yeah, a, a decade of, of labor for our team. Yeah, uh, it's really extraordinary that she, uh, although she's been dead since 1977, she's narrating uh, this film about uh, her her life and her work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we should also explain, or you should explain for us, it, this is kind of a rough cut. Uh, it's not the finished product. Uh, right. And you, you're, the, the, the stuff we saw on the screen of where it was coming from, that's eventually going to go. So we're kind of seeing uh, just a, uh, not quite the, the finished product, but very close to it. Exactly. Um, the, it, the, the soul of the movie is what you saw. But as we have found with this archival project, it can be very challenging to find who owns this stuff. Um, and then once you find out who owns it, it can be very challenging to raise the money to pay for it. Um, some of the easier ones to find, like ones owned by CBS or NBC, um, those cost $300 a second if we want to use it. Um, so the ones that are harder to find, often people will just say, oh, sure, you know, take it. <laughs> so there's, it's either you pay a lot in money or you pay a lot in the labor of hunting it down. But either way, um, we haven't hunted it all down yet. And um, that's why you see the watermarks or the time codes or stuff, because all of that's basically stuff that I stole. <laughs> um, and I do intend to pay for it as soon as I can find out who to give my money to. Um, but the idea is that we don't want to pay for stuff we're not going to use. And so screenings like this are invaluable to get an idea of how the story is working, um, what stuff we want to keep, what stuff we don't, what kind of stuff is worth paying for and what isn't. Uh, there were some people who were identified in the film. Other places, people weren't identified. People my age recognized some of them, like uh, uh, former Governor Paul Johnson was there for quite a bit. Will you, when you finally wind it up, you, will you be able to tell people this is Governor Johnson, this is Julian Bond, I, I, I think Bob Moses was in one scene where you yeah. be able to identify that. Um, I, I'm a little bit spoiled because my master's degree was in the history of the freedom movement. So I, I know all of these people like they're my family because I've spent so much time researching their lives. And so when I made the movie, my concept was we only know what Fannie Lou Hamer tells us. And any identification that was on screen was just in the original archival stuff. My producers have encouraged me to be a little more, <laughs> yeah, um, a little more accessible with that and, and put the names and stuff on screen, which definitely in the final cut will have like animations with the names. Yeah. You, know, you, you had a, a, some of the footage from her uh, testimony before the Credentials Committee at the famous uh, showdown with the Mississippi Freedom Democrats at the 1964 National Democratic Convention. And uh, it's a little bit of an interesting story about that uh, as she was talking and President Johnson, who was expecting this to be a great coronation for him, and suddenly uh, the show's being taken over by this uh, obscure black woman from Mississippi. Could you fill out that story for us? I, I think it's a wonderful one. Yeah, um, that was a really fascinating moment in democratic politics that really reverberates with us today because of the way that we elect our and, and our primaries and how each 
um, state and every and the convention has all these rules about super delegates and that sort of thing. Like those are ripple effects that came from this moment in time when there was an insurgent group called the Mississippi Freedom Democrats, and they wanted to make a point. They didn't care about Lyndon Johnson, you know, having a smooth coronation. They cared about Mississippi and they cared about their neighbors, and so they showed up and they completely upset the apple cart. It was supposed to be this celebration of Johnson. It was supposed to show the strength and unity of the Democratic Party, and here are these folks from Mississippi. Mississippi that were not invited, um, just showing up and raising hell and refusing to sit down and trying to push in at every point. And, you know, that was inspirational to a lot of people. And that was terrifying to Johnson because then Johnson would have to deal with problems that he wasn't prepared to deal with. He just wanted to waltz into the nomination and then into his next term. Um, and so where they would have been perhaps allies in a different setting, because I, I do think the, the history supports that Johnson was a, a firm supporter of civil rights, but he was inconvenienced by the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And so he used his powers of the presidency to try to shut them down. He sent out all of his agents to collect um, the delegates who were considering supporting the Freedom Democrats to try to get them not to support the Freedom Democrats. And so they all went to Atlantic City thinking, we are going to win. Like they had, they had enough support to get a roll call vote. And with a roll call vote, you go to the floor and then you're on national television airing your views. Um, Johnson stopped that. And then their last chance was with this credential committee meeting where it would be televised and you would have people like Reverend Ed King and Aaron Henry and Fannie Lou Hamer testifying. And Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony was so so powerful that Johnson cut it off. He called a press conference. He didn't have anything to say. <laughs> I, I interviewed um, Cortland Cox, who was a member of that delegation, and he said that um, Johnson called a press conference just to announce that Thursday was Thursday. He was so terrified of Fannie Lou Hamer's power. But ironically, by doing that, he made a story out of it. And so all of the news agencies were like, wait, if Johnson doesn't want people to hear this, we want to hear this. And so they ended up doing playing the pre-recorded tape of her entire speech after Johnson's press conference. So he kind of just shot himself in the foot there. Near the end, yeah, it was visible that she was aging. She was in poor health. But uh, you brought in the fact that like Dr. King and so many people in the movement, that she had uh, was moving some of her focus to a post-war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And that was also very inconvenient um, for a lot of mainstream Democrats. Um, you know, that, that radical insurgency again of people standing up against sort of larger policies that seemed unjust to them. Um, and that's one of the reasons that people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer and I mean, Stokely Carmichael, all these people who started to come out against the war in Vietnam lost a lot of support in mainstream democratic circles um, because they stepped out of their lane, so to speak. They stopped only talking about racism and they started talking about what we would probably call now intersectionality. How, you know, if we have, if we're fighting for people to vote for their own government in Vietnam, what about voting rights here? Like the, the war in Vietnam is a voting rights issue and it's therefore a race issue and a class issue and it, it's an everything issue just like everything is. And that was sort of an awakening of that sort of, I mean, they're already, they didn't call it intersectionality, but that's, that's what we might call it now where you, you see all of these intersections of oppressive mechanics um, and we might each have our view into one of those mechanics. But if you widen your scope a little bit, you see how we're all kind of held down by those systems. Questions from the audience. Alan? Uh, first, thank you for doing this. Uh, I'm old enough to remember seeing her on Vietnam television and her voice physical presence. Something that's not conveyed in the books. Doing that, I think, is, is very important. Uh, one question. The, the sound quality of this is actually very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's one of the problems with documenting Fannie Lou Hamer is they didn't. You know, the the stuff we're pulling from are just like folks with a tape recorder in an audience in a gymnasium somewhere. And so it's again, it again intersectionality. It comes back to capitalism. <laughs> like we it costs a lot of money to restore those things. So we're taking slow steps towards finding the better versions of things and restoring them, but absolutely, like some of it is is hard to hear. Um and, and yet, those are the best sources we have of her. And so that's a tension that I 
have been sitting with a lot is there are some moments that feel so crucial and the only thing we have is this kind of muddy recording from a high school gymnasium or something. <clears throat> that's a, yeah, that's, that's something that we're exploring. We actually, we have an illustrator named Ekua Holmes who did a children's book, illustrated a children's book on Fannie Lou Hamer and she has this really gorgeous style. It's kind of a collage style and so one of the things we're experimenting with is in those muddier, harder to hear segments, taking her illustrations and putting text with that so you can get a better sense of what's being said. Yeah, thank you. Just there. Um, yes. Um, oh. I'm happy to take all questions. Okay. Thank you so much. It's not a question. It was a <laughs> bit of praise for those of you who can't hear that she loved the photography. Uh, Warren. Yeah, sure. Um, I was uh, expecting to see, and I wonder if you have a comment on the, I guess it was the 68 convention where uh, Hubert Humphrey um, did, um, did not want to allow Fannie Lou Hamer to speak because she said, he said, we don't want an illiterate person. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't see that in the film, but yeah, I, I don't know where that source is of him saying that. Um, it, if if you want to talk afterwards, if you know, I'd love to find that. Okay. Um, but that was something she ran into all the time. Yes, was, was folks saying that she didn't deserve a platform because she was illiterate, yeah. which um, we can all we can all hear the truth of what she is saying without any kind of, you know, yeah. right. <laughs> There's a little bit of a history there that uh, she, she resented Humphrey deeply because of his role at the 64 convention and the alleged compromise where she felt that uh, the Freedom Democrats were given short shrift and that Humphrey had been delegated by Johnson to solve the thing and she felt that uh, he solved it uh, on the side of uh, people other than the Freedom Democrats. So it was mutual resentment between Ms. Hamer and uh, Hubert Humphrey. Only she and Ed King were president. Uh, Aaron Henry, and, uh, uh, Aaron Henry and, and Ed King were the two people who- Who were the two people in 64 who were going 64. to be- they were, th Those were the two who were selected by the Democratic Party for the two seats at large. Yeah, and they, they, and they wouldn't go through with it. And uh, meanwhile, the the- Governor's white delegation walked out too, and uh, Mississippi wound up having uh, no representation at the uh, at the convention. Mm -hmm. and, and that is yeah. j just a, a larger point to what you said. There are so many of these wonderful tidbits in her life, and it I'd love them all to be in the film. Um, and as we find new things, we come up with new versions. This is maybe the third version of the film where we added in some bits about the Freedom Farm. Um, the next version of the film is also going to have some bits about her family. So if I can find that footage, then, you know, the, this is the collage in the making. Yeah. Warren. I absolutely intended it, um, 100%. And, well, and, and there, I snuck in some modern footage. I mean, you know, there's there's footage from Rodney King being beaten. You know, there's footage from many racially motivated crimes be, um, included. There's footage of, of new excursions, military excursions around the world, all things that if you didn't know, you'd, you, you didn't know if she's talking about 1960, 1970, or 2019. Um, I have actually have been talking to a lot of public television representatives to try to get this on the air before the 2020 election. That's, that, that is my goal for this movie. Got time for one more question right here.
Mm-hmm. Well, th- there's kind of like three parts to the strategy. One was just at that moment, there was a major problem with federal funding for food, for for poor folks to get food. Um, and Mississippi played games with that funding. They cut it specifically to punish the activists. And so there were people starving to death because the state government had decided to punish these people that stepped out of line. And that led to deaths. And so that was one very urgent reason she was doing that. Um, She also very much identified with the plight of sharecroppers, poor folks who would work all year long and not have enough to feed their kids. And so that was a very personal thing. But then also with SNCC and with a lot of the more radical organizations, it was about getting, putting themselves in a position to garner sympathy from potential allies, um, to, to realize that there, there are things that people can reach across racial boundaries, political boundaries, and say, like, you don't want kids to starve, right? That's, it's as simple as that. So it, it, there were a lot of elements to that strategy, you know, historical, personal, and then also kind of tactical. Joy, thank you. And uh, let's hear it again for Joy Devonport. Mm-hmm.